I think I think money laundering should not be criminalized. I've been thinking about this lately. I think if you have money in your pocket, it doesn't matter where it came from. You should have the right to spend that money without scrutiny. If you committed a crime in the past, you should be prosecuted for the crime, but not for you spending the money from the crime. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to season two of Crypto Nights, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we're live from the CC Forum where we had one of the craziest debates. And here, BTCC founder Bobby Lee will edutain you all. Bobby Lee, it's a pleasure to have you, Great. my friend. Thank you for having me, Alex. Thank you so much for being here. So Bobby Lee, you've been through a lot. You've gone from going to the classical background of engineering and then moved to this space. If you can kick off by just telling us some why? What was your big purpose, the meaning for you to come into the decentralized movement? Yeah, so I, when I first got to learn about Bitcoin, it was actually 2011. Um, it was very, you know, looking back, it was very early. At the time, it didn't feel like it was super early. It just felt like it was a new thing on the horizon. At the time, to be honest, we didn't think much about the word decentralization. So the whole idea of Bitcoin being a decentralized digital asset class, the, the word decentralized or the word blockchain did not play a prominent role. What did play a prominent role was the idea that this is a digital money for the first time, we could use cryptography to have digital money. So I remember my brother, Charlie, who introduced me to Bitcoin. We were talking about in early 2011, um, can this be worth a lot? Can, can Bitcoin, can digital money be worth a lot? At the time, it was only $100, $150 million worth of Bitcoin in circulation. So Bitcoin was, was way cheap, if you will. Uh, but he and I were already investors in gold. We had, a, we had a very, very good understanding of why gold was valuable even though gold wasn't something that you could literally use on a day-to-day -day basis, but that it was ascribed value to it. Society put value to gold. So with that background, we understood that there are things in life that could have value due to its physical properties or its components. And in this case, Bitcoin is very valuable. Uh, and, you know, in the last 10 years, in the last eight years, uh, it's gone up a hundred, a thousand times. That's a really good point. So do you still believe Bitcoin is digital gold? Some people call it cash. Some people call it even a tech stock because Metcalf's <laughs> law, you know, the adoption of, of the actual community and the network effects. If to you, is digital gold the best definition for yeah, Bitcoin? Yeah, it's certainly not a stock, not an equity because equity stock will represent a company that makes profit, that makes money. So Bitcoin doesn't represent any company. It's not shares of a company. Uh, it's, it's cash in the sense that it can be used for transactions, for buying, selling. But for me, what's most important behind that is actually it's a digital asset. So, so people call, some people call it digital gold. I would say it's equivalent. It, it is an asset that is not backed by anything else. So Bitcoin, the units of Bitcoin, whether it's one Bitcoin, more than one or less than one, it's not backed by anything. It's just, it's just a ledger, a global blockchain ledger, a decentralized ledger that allows people to keep track of how many Bitcoins I have, how many Bitcoins you have. You send me some, I send you some. We can both send them to other people. And it's just movement, movement of these Bitcoins all around. And human society, we ascribe value to that. That's why it has a market price that's trading on exchanges 24 seven a day. That's fantastic. In terms of Bitcoin's evolution and how the cryptocurrency played out since the early days where you're in, yeah. are you happy with the outcome? How has it, how has it actually developed over the years? Absolutely. I think, yeah? I think it's, been, it's, been, it's been a tremendous ride. Obviously, you know, some of us invest in Bitcoin in the early days. And we've seen our Bitcoin prices go up over a hundred times. And it's, it's, it's financially rewarding to be hodling, to be holding onto this Bitcoin. And I'm still holding onto it. Uh, so it's financially rewarding. And I think most importantly, it gives people, gives the world today a choice to have our value stored in a decentralized way, in a digital uh, fashion, where the knowledge of the private key allows you access to your value, where that cannot be confiscated. That is the most important thing that Bitcoin cannot be confiscated because no one can steal information from my brain. There's always possible deniability. And that in that sense is an unconfiscatable asset that's digital that can be transferred anywhere in the world uh, for very low cost uh, instantly, practically. Uh, in that sense, very, very valuable as a global asset class, especially in the world where today people are printing money like crazy. Yeah. Central <laughs> banks are printing money like crazy. They call it quantitative, quantitative easing. easing. I mean, yeah. this. You know, how many syllables that is, it's amazing. <laughs> the biggest problem today is the money system that we use. Money, money is used in all parts of society, all over the world, in every economy. And the money we use today is not just in the paper form or the coin form, but also the digital money that circulates in banks and transfers and so on. 
that money system today is no longer asset backed. It's no longer asset based rather. We're using a debt based money system that can be inflated and printed and increased with, without our sort of cooperation. Central banks around the world will unilaterally decide to increase the money supply in all these countries and they do it in the name of to prevent you know, the Great Recession, the Great Depression and so on. But the reality is by having that control, the central bankers all over the world, they have tremendous power over the people. Today, none of us here are enslaved. I don't see any shackles on any of your hands. But if I tell you that your work and your labor over the last three years and three months or the last 30 years can be arbitrarily taxed by the government where they can just take out your earnings through the use of inflation and money printing, then we might as well be working for the, for the guy, for the, for the government. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. The problem is today we're invisibly shackled to the system because our work, so we all go to work, whether it's today, tomorrow, this year, this month. If the wages for that work can be arbitrarily taken away from us without our permission as humans, as citizens of a country, then I think that's a big problem. And that's yeah. the problem with today's debt-based money system. So is that one of the coolest things of Bitcoin in terms of the economic factors, the fact that it's yep. fixed supply? Is that yep. the most I think, powerful I think component? that's, if, if I were to say the single most important thing of it is, is a fixed supply. Uh, that was brilliant uh, to, to have a fixed supply. And of course, then of course the decentralization is important, then the private keys, all that stuff is all very important. It's all, it's all interlocked, right? You can't, really, you can't really say you can take one away without taking the others away. But, but what's most important, what's, what's very important, let's say, is a fixed supply. And yeah. do you like the fact that it's deflationary in terms of the mining and the happening where the scarcity increases yeah. bit by bit? Well, if you, if you want fixed supply, you, it has to be deflationary by nature. By the way, yeah. there's nothing wrong with deflationary. I think yeah. the society over time, people have ascribed to this negative connotation. Deflationary is bad, deflation yeah. is bad. Well, the reason is inflationary is good, right? That, that, that's what they're trying to say. But I, I kind of disagree. I'm looking back at money I earned as a teenager, you know, working at an intern, a summer internship, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Well, it was more than 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, you know, that money that I saved and spent, it's worth a lot less today. What, how is that kosher? How is that good? I don't think that's good at all. You know, people, the people who, who are near retirement age who worked for 30 years, 40 years, and the money they earned in the early days, if they didn't spend it, it's worth a fraction of what, what it is today. And I don't think that's good. Why is that any good? And you made some really good points by showing the dollar bill. You even showed like a zero. Yeah. Euro yeah. Bill. <laughs> that was hilarious. That caught people by it. surprise. Yeah, this is zero zero euro note that's actually sanctioned by the ECB as a souvenir note. That yeah, is a real note. <laughs> that was so funny. That was so funny. But you're right because you know over the time, you know, my my parents used to tell me that a loan to pay off your your student loan would buy maybe your mid twenties, it would already be completely paid off. But nowadays, I have cousins in their forties and still paying off. They're still paying off their oh, because of high interest. It's really ridiculous. I mean, the, the system is really. I think the rich have gone away with really milking the system and they've really cornered the market for wealth and, um, and money. And a lot of people, a lot of the working class, are, it's, you know, I, I think it's a little bit controversial, but it's called, it's, the working class has become the slave class in some sense. You, people, you see people working two jobs, uh, families barely making the ends meet, and their income has gone up over the years, but their purchasing power has gone down actually. So it's really, the world is in a really tough situation. There are definitely clear charts showing the wealth disparity, uh, how the rich yeah, are getting I, richer, the poor. Getting, I think I mean, that's, I, I pers now personally, I myself have gotten wealthier with Bitcoin, but I think it's terrible that the world, the, the wealth gap has gone bigger and bigger. I, I grew up in Africa. I saw firsthand in a developing country what it was like living there. And obviously there's education that's important. There's health, there's sanitation, all of that. But I, I hope, you know, as we, as, as my generation enter uh, the elderly, you know, as we as we enter the political system to to influence the the politics and legislator, I hope that the world comes back together and look after uh, the global class of citizens and not just worry about the rich. Right? Basically, we really need to take care of the whole of the whole world. Yeah. Well, that's great. And hopefully, by you know these type of shows, you can educate people, other people can educate, and make them yeah. realize that we don't want the rich to own all the Bitcoin. If the uh, of course, of course, free, right? Yeah, absolutely. We want, no, it's not just Bitcoin, it's just life in general. In we, general want, yeah. we want more people have access to money that can truly be transformative and truly be worthy, right? We don't want, I'd like to see more um, people in the developing nations, if you will, the up and coming nations, 
start putting their money in cryptocurrency, which they can really own and hold physically, and they can really have ownership to and not be convinced to put their money in an inflationary asset that that can lose value at a moment's notice. It's crazy right. that this is not taught to us at school, just understanding money itself and university. Right. It's like, That's what? Right. Yeah. It's sad, but but uh, yeah, definitely going back to the debate. So we fast yeah. forward, we go from uh, you know your your upbringings, going from engineer, being fascinated by Bitcoin, the evolution, and now we're today, crazy debate with Norel Rubini, uh, calling using the S H I T coins. Yeah, a lot. I'm a surprised lot. He, call, he kept calling it that. I'm like, <laughs> you know, how was your overall feeling or impression here? Well, I was disappointed. Debate? Like he kept. Can, can I say the word or no? Yeah, or, of course. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the shit coins, right? Yeah. So he kept referring to that. He, at one point, he claimed that I'm a shit coin supporter. I'm clearly not a shit coin supporter. I'm a Bitcoin supporter at, at the absolute maximum. Um, it's funny. He he had no response to my questions. I was I was pointing out that uh, what's happening with money today is money is actually today is actually debt based. It's no longer asset based. For the for the mass vast majority of our human history, money had been asset based. Whereas backed by gold, backed by tangible assets which cannot be inflated and printed out of thin air. But only after 1971, we switched to the so-called fiat money, which is debt-based, which is uh, which is based on no tangible assets, and it's based on the will of the United States to pay back its creditors. And now they can just issue more debt and issue more money to just raise the debt ceiling and print more money. And it's, it's really ridiculous. The so-called Fed, like these complicated terms, like the Federal Reserve has a balance sheet that's really big. What does that mean? It means the Federal Reserve has used its purchasing uh, power, its, its um, if, if credit score, if you will, credit limit to buy US dollars and print more US dollars into circulation. It's crazy. It's crazy. They use they use a the balance sheet to buy, they take these bad loans and these uh, toxic uh, derivatives and they buy it and they pay cash. And that's how money gets circulated into the system. So basically we're saying all these bad loans, all these companies who should have gone bankrupt, we're gonna bail them out and give them another lease on life and by printing more money to flood the system. And who loses? The common person. Everyone who has federal notes, US dollar notes in their pocket, whether it's $1 or $100, you're getting that shaved away because the Federal Reserve has printed more and put in circulation. I don't support shit coins. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> you support, you support shit there fiat. There's nothing wrong with the it's US It's like me dollar. saying you support Sorry. shit fiat. It's a are you behind the Zimbabwe it's dollars? It's a means of payment. Are you behind it's the Argentina peso? Are you behind the Venezuela bolivar? Are you behind the Indian rupee? There are there are 200 currencies in the world. Two or three of them are There are failing. thousands Most of, of them shit coins. Are fine. I don't care about the shit coins. I'm talking about the U.S. of D, U.S. of A, the U.S. dollar. E everybody wants the U.S. dollar. No one wants Let me ask coins. You, That's for the reality. U.S. dollar, this say. U.S. dollar, 30 years ago, it was worth a lot to me, and the same piece of paper is worth a lot less to me today. Is that cool? Inflation is less than 2%. Is that cool? Is, uh, is if less you left it in the bank, there are plenty, 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 plenty of ways you can add There are plenty of ways you can add yourself against inflation. That, that, is, that is not acceptable, okay? Your answer is not acceptable. You're avoiding the topic. You're avoiding the question. Uh, who, who, who understands the C, uh, ECB, yes, uh, the European Central yes. Bank? Yes. Why, why do they have a zero-dollar note from the ECB? Explain this to me, Professor. Yeah, what the have hell you is seen that? This? What the hell is that? What is that? What the hell is that? <laughs> huh? You have, you have, you have shit, you have shit you have shit fiat that has zero on it right there. <laughs> is that what you endorse? That sounds like BSV. So do you believe like the key point is fair grounds, like this whole decentralized movement in terms of entry investments, in terms of owning and the whole thing is just creating a fair ground? For yeah, everyone? they made a good point. I, I can I, I, I agree with which is centralization is decentralization. It's actually a spectrum. Yeah, spectrum. So, so yeah. it's hard to say exactly what is decentralized, what, what is, is not. So yeah. I don't want to get into that argument. Yeah. My point is that uh, we want to give people a choice of either owning physical fiat money or to own digital currencies. And in digital currency, I also agree, there's a lot of shit coins out there. But obviously, I think Bitcoin is the, the one coin. Now there's other ones where there's Litecoin, Ethereum, and so on, and there's like all the shit coins down, down the spectrum. So I don't wanna get, it's like, like one, I hope that one app, bad apple doesn't ruin the, the whole, whole basket, right? Mm -hmm. But the point is that, let's look at Bitcoin, let's look at that as a digital currency. Uh, can that play a role in the global economy going forward? And I think a lot of central bankers are afraid of it. They're vastly afraid. So they're, they're all you know, trying to checkmate this and not let Bitcoin take off.
Mm. And obviously, Bitcoin maximalists are huge these days and the yes. dominance in the market over 70%. Uh, a lot of people love Ethereum for introducing smart contracts and a virtual machine. Yeah. Uh, how? What is your take on Ethereum? You know, I, I I never gone to Ethereum very early, so I admit I didn't. I missed the the wave. Um, I own some Ethereum today, um, but but to me, what's more interesting, even even as a computer scientist, uh, I, I have computer science degrees from Stanford University, and uh, for me, the notion of virtual machine and all that, I think it's cool, but. To me, what's more interesting is is Bitcoin, is the economic notion that we can have digital money, uh, a global asset class that's digital and truly, well, I, I do consider it truly decentralized and people can freely move it without permission uh, and do it in a pseudo anonymous way. So I think that's much, much more exciting than a computer hardcore problem about virtual machines and on the blockchain and stuff like that. So to be honest with you, I myself don't do any smart contracts. I don't issue any tokens. I'm not a fan of ICOs. I don't do anything like that. So I'm very much a hardcore Bitcoin uh, maximalist, if you will. So in China, real estate transactions are controlled by the government, buy, sell. Like all the rest, I'm sure. Like what? Like all the rest of the domains. Yeah, so so for imagine if you have real estate on the blockchain and you own the private key to that unit or to that allocation of real estate on the blockchain. But you having the private keys to it is meaningless because uh, because the actual real estate could be confiscated. It could be forbidden to be transferred to someone else. So in the end, you know, when you use blockchain private keys to represent external assets, you still have that trust issue. And if you can't solve that trust issue, then it's meaningless. That's why I like Bitcoin because Bitcoin itself is not based on anything else. It's not backed by anything yep. else. Do you believe that eventually among, you know, all these tokens, just like the dot-com bubble, a few will emerge as potential successful uh, projects? Yeah, you? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't like the word project. I think project has yeah. it's got a bad taint to it already. Uh. <laughs> uh, I, I think Bitcoin, Bitcoin is the one. Is the one, but, yeah. But you have several others in the coin market cap. It's going to be the power law where it, where one coin will have 80% of the value mm. and the remaining 80% will have 20% of the 20%. value. So it's going to be a very steep, steep drop off. Yeah. Awesome. That's fascinating. And so in terms of the debate itself, obviously the, that shitcoin thing was brought up. How do you feel about uh, Rubini talking about how Bitcoin is only used for drugs, for criminals, for money laundering and all that type of stuff? What, what is your I, response? I don't recall him saying that in my debate, but my, oh, my, was... my general answer is that um, something being used for nefarious purposes doesn't taint the thing itself, right? A knife, a steak knife can be used for nefarious purposes. Scissors can be used for nefarious purposes. And the U.S. dollar bill has been used for nefarious purposes, whether it's gold, cash, you know, a lot of jewelry. Uh, so marijuana has been used for nefarious purposes. But today, some states in the U.S., marijuana is legal. And in some cases, it's, not, it's, it's illegal. So the point is, I think you should judge it for what it is and not uh, be swept up by, by talking points about Bitcoin or whatever being used for nefarious purposes. So I don't buy into that at all. I think guns have been used for nefarious purposes. But... Are guns okay? I think that should be judged by for what it is. I mean, law enforcement uses guns, you know. So that's a really good point. So he's kind of attacking the people themselves and not oh, yeah. the, the yeah, actual yeah. technology. I, I think that, I think it's it's a it's a shady argument at best. Mm. And so you've been in in China for the past is it ten years? I lived there for the last thirteen years. Thirteen years. I moved there in two thousand six. I started BTC China. Yeah. Uh, as a co-founder, CEO, uh, and then I sold the company last year, early last year. Yeah. It was a great exit. Great job. Uh, <laughs> and in hindsight, I was I was uh, look you know it's it's actually a good move. I want to get out of the exchange business, and you know we're do, we're able to do it responsibly. Uh, and we had to shut down the, the China exchange site, btcchina.com. And that was in late 2017. Late 2017, Due to yeah. government pressure. Speaking yeah. of which, like, how would you respond to those who, you know, everyone has their own objection, whether yeah. it's for legal use or, but a lot of people say, yeah, if the US government wants to shut this stuff down, Trump hates this Bitcoin, he tweeted about it. Uh, if the government shuts us down, we're over. How, how do you respond to those type of objections? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, I think companies are, Obviously, companies operate in the context of a country, in the jurisdiction of a country. So co companies can be shut down, whether it's Coinbase, whether it's Binance, or any of the large companies can be shut down. Uh, just like we found out, you know, BTCC, our China exchange, BTC China got shut down. We, we had to shut it down. But I think the underlying cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin, and especially Bitcoin, I don't think that can ever be shut down because there will always be people independently uh, in countries where they have freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, where they can go and purchase equipment, computing power to mine Bitcoin. 
So I don't think that's ever at risk. I think Bitcoin will last as long as the internet. It seems like, you know, whenever someone shuts it down, then the neighboring countries like, well, that's going to open up money for us. Absolutely. We'll welcome it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think I think countries can at best force companies to close. But the underlying Bitcoin protocol, the propagation of blocks, the confirmation of blocks, all the hashing, the transactions, you signing a transaction, sending on Bitcoin. I don't think that will ever stop. Yeah, a lot of people say it's like shutting yeah. off the Internet. And actually, I saw people in the UK like send send Bitcoin through radio waves. Absolutely. It's perfectly fine without the Internet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they, they criticize Bitcoin only has a low, you know, seven or 15 transactions per second. To me, it's not a problem because think about this. Gold is tremendously valuable, right? The, the amount of gold in central banks, huge. The total today, globally, there's eight trillion dollars worth of gold, eight trillion dollars of gold ever in the world, all the gold above ground, okay? The central banks own a good portion of that. How fast do you think the gold moves around central banks? Is it seven transactions per second? Not nearly, right? My point is gold can be valuable without it having to move around like Visa credit card payments, right? I think it's a misnomer that you have to compare the value of gold to its ability, how many transactions per second. I think it's a huge misnomer. It's a, it's a, it's a bad argument. It's a bad argument. And Absolutely. it's a really good point because these days we entered the era of digital nomads and people like to travel around the world, right? Yeah. They want to they don't want to have to carry gold. Like I have my cousins, they said before finding a company, I want to go to at least seven countries before <laughs> I start choosing, you know, the millennials, they, they think differently from me. I'm a bit old. Great, but, great. but do you believe that that's also a factor that millennials will push the fact that they don't want to buy a house oh, yeah. too early, they oh, want to yeah. travel? Yeah. And, uh, absolutely. I mean, the teenagers today, they will be the central bankers in 50 years. Think about that. The teenagers today will be the central bankers. They will be the Federal Reserve Board chairman. They'll be the chairman of, of the, the banking committees. You know, even, even right, all these organizations, the United Nations, all these organizations, the World Bank, they'll be run by people who are teenagers today. And what will there be their attitude 50 years from now? Of course, they'll embrace cryptocurrency. Why wouldn't they? They grew up with cryptocurrency. Right. That's a really so you can't you can't change it. it. It's going to be the old guard will just keep pushing back, and then they're going to die, and then the new people will come over and take over. That's that's just the the way of life, right? You can hate it until you die. That is <laughs> such a good point. That's a really good point because Tom Lee yeah. always stresses the fact that at every generational gap, and when they reach the peak of their wealth, there's a huge change and the type or behavior and investments, right? So, but I never thought about, yeah, they will be running they will the be. central banks. Yeah, yeah, they will be. And they'll all have their Bitcoins, Ethereum and so on. Yeah. It'll be normal to them. It'll right? be normal. <laughs> yeah. Countries, by then countries will have their assets in digital currencies. Yeah, mark my words. They will have their, their national, you know, war chest in Bitcoins and cryptocurrencies. Not the shit coins, but the good ones. The good coins. <laughs> yeah. It's just like it's just like countries today have reserve currencies in the US dollar, the euro. Yeah, yeah. They don't have any Zimbabwe dollars. They don't have any Argentina pesos or uh, Venezuelan bolivars. Yeah. But they have US dollars and the euro and the Japanese, Japanese yen. yen. Why? Yeah. Because those are strong currencies. Strong currency. Same thing. In 20 years, 50 years, countries will have reserve currency, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum. They won't have the shit coins, but they have the good ones. You know XRP or whatever the good ones are. So you see that repeating itself, kind Absolutely. of history, history Absolutely. repeating itself. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And since you had an exchange, I have a very. Uh, you're the expert in this field. I'm sure you'll give a great perspective. But in terms of the exchanges, you're in that business. What would you like to see in the future of exchanges? Obviously, <laughs> is there something we're missing today that could help mass adoption? Yeah. Uh, go I, faster. I or? think uh, if I were to, you know, may, wave a magic wand, I would want governments to catch up on regulation. I'd like for them to really globally issue global regulation on how to run an exchange. I'm not saying heavy regulation, but I want I want them to properly classify exchanges, custody and stuff like that, not drag their feet. Today, the regulation is really old school. It's really dragging their feet. It's really encumbered by all the anti-money laundering rules and laws. It's really awful. It's really, really awful. I'm, a, I'm not a big supporter of AML and uh, money laundering uh, regulation. I think I think money laundering should not be criminalized. I've been thinking about this lately. I think money laundering should not be criminalized. I think people, if you have money in your pocket, it doesn't matter where it came from. You should have the right to spend that money without scrutiny. If you committed a crime in the past, you should be prosecuted for the crime, but not for you spending the money from the crime. That, so anyways, that's what's holding back exchange regulation right now. The all the policies, AML stuff, all the roadblock, roadblock all the stuff. Roadblock. Yeah, all the money related financial fraud and stuff like that. I think it's, I think it's it, well. I'm not a supporter of criminals. I'm I'm definitely not against. I'm definitely against criminal activity. What I'm saying is, the criminal activity has happened. It's like a murder, right? If you 
if 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 you know there's a there's a there's a criminal who murdered someone, they should be prosecuted for the murder, but not for how they spend the money to go to a movie, to watch a movie, or to to fly on an airplane, right? That action should not be illegal, but the murder should be the crime itself. So today, a lot of exchanges are being caught up in the regulation globally because they're saying, if someone committed a murder or someone stole money from someone else, and that money flew into an, uh, flowed into an exchange, well, how do we track it? How do you, oh, it's just, it's just a mess. It's just a mess. I'm glad I got out of the business, but if there is better regulation globally, then there'll be more fair competition uh, there'll be more responsible custodianship. Uh, money can be spent where it is, where it should be spent on security, user education, and bringing uh, global adoption and uh, liquidity. So that people feel extremely safe and they can realize Absolutely. it's easy, it's yeah. regulated, it's secure. Okay, now I can yes. get my money. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would like to see that globally. Oh, yeah. that's beautiful. But it, it's, it's a wishful thinking. It's going to take a long, long time. But well, there's one thing that's really cool is you are helping mass adoption with oh, yeah. the new products, right? Yes, yes. We want ballet is our yeah. I'm glad we we can talk Thank about this. Thank you so this. much, by the way. Yes. This one. So ballet is is my new uh, startup. We're making this wallet to basically increase global adoption to make cryptocurrency accessible to everyone. We're making cryptocurrency truly accessible to everyone by making it physical because the rest of the world don't know how to do backup key recovery. You know, backing up, writing these 24 it's words. Scary. Scary. They don't know how to do firmware upgrades. They don't know how to do software downloads, account registrations. They don't. They barely have two-factor authentication on their phone, like Google two-factor authentication. Yeah. They don't know how to do SMS uh, uh, verification. They get SIM hijacked and stuff like that. A lot of email passwords, just account reset accounts, just crazy, it's crazy so barriers. Bad. This is no setup. What we call is easy, safe, reliable. You get this wallet. It has an instant deposit address on it. Um, and then you can just send Bitcoin and we support multi-currencies. So you can Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, XRP. We support over a dozen currencies with more coming. We revealed this last month. We're launching later this month when we ship our first units at the end of October. Fantastic. Could my grandma Susie use it as well? Absolutely. <laughs> Is your grandma's name Susie? Literally. <laughs> it's an imaginary grandma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine. Totally, totally. Your grandma can use it. My parents can use it. Your parents can use it. You have children. You have nieces and nephews. Yeah. You have you have you have classmates from high for school yeah. for your daughter. Yeah, Absolutely. Daughter. Buy Bitcoin for them, put it in, and then give them to them as a happy birthday gift, as a graduation gift, as a wedding gift, as an engagement gift. Down the road, I'm gonna see people, I'm gonna say, instead of proposing uh for for, for marriage, instead of proposing with a diamond ring, you propose with Bitcoin and a diamond ring. That is so good. In right? terms of the, the security itself. 100%. Top notch. Top top notch. notch. I am very responsible. I ran one of the biggest exchanes holding custody for hundreds of yeah, millions of, yeah. of dollars worth of Bitcoin. We have what we call a two factor key generation process where we generate the private keys in two locations. So we do the passphrase in Las Vegas, double blind, no one sees it, offline computer, hard drive. And we create the private key in China on a, on a two factor, on a temper evidence sticker. No way. And then we put that on a steel card, we mail it to the US, and then we etch it on so that no one's seen both pieces, not even our employees. And we actually cryptographically check to make sure the address and the private key and the passwords match up before we sell the units. That is amazing. Yeah. So I take this very responsibly. So now the user can now have real Bitcoin in their hands and they can own the private keys to it because our company won't have the backup. So if you lose it, however, what happens when you lose a gold bar? It's gone. It's gone. Yeah. So if, as long as you don't lose it, keep it physical, then you will not get hacked. 100% offline cold storage. Bobby Lee, I know you're extremely busy, but thank you so much for taking the time yeah. today. We want you back on Crypto Nights. Definitely great, next time great. you're in London, we're here, we, we won't move. So we'll always awesome. be here to welcome you. And thank you for educating you. the thank community. You, Alex. For all those watching out there, don't forget to like, comment. If you have any questions for Bobby Lee, put them below. We'll try to get back with an answer and definitely blast that bell notification. And don't forget, we're premiering every Wednesday at eight o'clock BST, thank you so much, guys. See you next week.